ask you a question. I was just listening. We're talking about kids. We're talking about the students we're passionate about. Um, can you raise your hands if you have uh, children of your own at home? Or yeah, just put nice and high for me. Keep your hands in the air. I'm just looking around the room. That's why there's 1,200 of us here today, isn't there? Let's be quite clear about this. Um, keep your hands in the air if you have or have survived having teenage children. Yeah, I didn't need to ask that question. I could have just looked around the room, couldn't I? Because we all have the same body. Thank you, put your hands down. That body language that says, oh my God. And it's what I have, I, well, I, I don't anymore. I have a daughter of 20 and a son who's nearly 17. It's why I haven't been home in six weeks. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to tell you about my daughter uh, this afternoon, but I do, I do want to tell you a little bit about my, my son. My, my younger child. Um, by the way, before I start this, I'm not one of those typical proud parents. You know those parents that we all have to face on a daily basis, who, when we meet them, do not believe their child can be anything other than perfect, right? I know my son is not perfect. He is just a typical stinky teenage boy, right? Um, and I, I want to set that into context for you. But he, like most of our kids, never fails to remind me just how remarkable they are. So the other afternoon, I had to go up to his uh, bedroom to tell, it was, tell him it was time for the evening meal. Now anyone, and I've already heard technology mentioned today, I have fast come to the conclusion that technology is not advancing us at all, by the way, okay? Let me explain why. When I was given the job many years ago of being the caller of the evening meal to my children, my wife, and I used to think it was such an important job. It was a way to get out the cooking, frankly. Um, my wife would say to me, it's time for dinner. Can you get the kids down? Now, I don't know if I'm like most men in this room, but what I hear when she says that is not, can you go and fetch them, please? It's can you shout them down for dinner? So for many years, like a herald, I would stand there and go, dinner! <laughs> and they would come scuttling down the stairs. Then technology arrived, right? Now, a few years ago, my son, and I'm sure many of you will share this, my son got himself a pair of noise-canceling headphones, which he uses on his computer system. So now I can no longer shout him down for the evening meal. Then, thank God, we bought him a cell phone, which meant I could text him in capital letters. So it was still like shouting, but it was evening meal time, until he blocked me from his phone. <laughs> so now, for the first time ever, this march of progress means I physically have to climb the stairs, knock on his door, and fetch him for the dinner, right? Now, the other day I did this, I knocked on the door, no reply. I knew what was going on. On the other side of the door, he'd have his uh, noise-canceling headphones on, and he'd be playing on his computer game. And I walked in the door, and sure enough, he sat there with a bank of screens, his back's to me, with a bank of screens, and he said, I promise you he looked like a James Bond villain. <laughs> you know those moments, I'm expecting him to turn around, stroking a white cat, going, Father, I have been expecting you. <laughs> At which point, I'd look for the trap door in the shark tank, right? Now, so I walked in the other day, no, no, totally oblivious to me, and I stood at the back of the room, and I was watching him. And he was playing his game of choice at the moment on his Xbox, which is FIFA soccer. Now, that wasn't unusual. But what was unusual was what he was saying into the microphone. Because he wasn't speaking in English. He was talking to someone somewhere else in the world in fluent Russian. Now, this is remarkable for two main reasons. Firstly, we're British. <laughs> we don't do foreign languages. You may have noticed this, even when I come here, where we, I swear to you, you don't talk the same language. Um, where British people, wherever they go in the world, think the way you talk other people's languages is to speak English louder and slower. 
So any foreign language teaching is, is there anyway. So that's the first thing. The other thing is he is learning modern foreign languages at school. He's learning two of them. He's learning really useful global languages, French and German. Um, <laughs> why, do, why do we do that? He's learning French and German. Now, here's the thing about English school's language teaching, right? He's an A-grade student in both of those subjects, but he can't speak a word of either. But he's speaking fluent Russian to somebody on the other end of this computer game. When he'd finished the game, he turned around, he saw me, he took his headphones off, and he said, are you all right, Dad? Because I'm stood there like this. <laughs> Suddenly, I'm like the teenage Neanderthal, you know, the one that can't actually put words together. Dad, are you OK? <laughs> and he said, what? I said, how, how did you do that? He said, oh, the Russian. I said, yeah, the Russian. He said, well, about a year ago, I met a guy called Yuri. We met playing an online tournament, FIFA tournament. I didn't even know you could do that. He said, we met playing a tournament about a year ago. Um, through the tournament, we just became friends. And now we meet up once or twice a week to play games and just chat to each other. He said, it was never a plan. He said, I never planned to learn Russian. He said, but the thing is, as the last year's gone on, he blushed a bit. He said, when we started out together, the first thing that happened was we taught each other how to swear in our own language. I thought, obviously. Um, he said, but as the year's gone on, we've just caught up with each other and taught each other phrases. And, and he said, I don't even think about it now. Now, as Andrew was talking, I wasn't just thinking about what he was saying to me as a parent. I was thinking about the challenges that presents to all of us in whatever capacity we work with kids in education. Because one of the things that fascinates me about tech, about the future, about their world, about their pathways, is they simply don't see the world the way we did. They don't see the world set in fixed routes from A to B to C. They see the world so differently, don't they? Their capabilities, their abilities to network, to communicate, to collaborate on a human level, to learn from one another, is truly extraordinary. So one of the great challenges I think we face when we think about the future of preparing our kids for their future, is to remember that we shouldn't be looking at that future through our lens. Because that's like too many steps removed. We need to start by looking at the future through their lens. Does that make sense? Because we're almost a generation out. And so when we're talking about pathways and preparation for the future, to do that through our experiences, through our life journey, is going to be, to an extent, irrelevant. But more challengingly than that, if we do, it's just going to feel like another initiative. You know, ACP, the more I've spent time researching it, looking into it, looking into what you're doing here in this great state, it's remarkable stuff. But I've already overheard conversations while I've been here today about the frustrations that some of you have in implementing this in your own districts, in your own schools. The mixed economy of how many of your colleagues and the administrators get it, support you fully, are active in the process. And I think this is something over the next two days that you're here together, you need to really share and talk and be honest about. Because one of the real fears for me about something this important and this exciting is that for some of our colleagues, this is just going to feel like another silver bullet. You know what I mean? How many new initiatives have you lived through in your time working in education? And how many of them have been the one? 
No, this really is. No, this one is the one. This is the one. And we come to events like this, and you hear from people like me, and you go, away, go, no, it's the one. Hallelujah, we found the answer. Here it is, this is the answer. You know what's happening back in your districts and your schools now. When you go back to work, nobody is going to want to talk to you. <laughs> you know it. Doors will be slammed in your faces. The skeptics will go, go on then. What new idea are we going to have to implement now? Because the problem is we've got cupboards full of new ideas, haven't we, in education? Thousands of them. The silver bullet. This is it. The Holy Ghost. This is the one. Everything go right back 20, 30 years. All of them have catchy names. All of them are the future. And then six months later, we have a new future with a new catchy name, and this is really the answer. So I totally understand the skepticism in our education communities. I get it. Because the problem is that so many of those new initiatives that we've lived through, and if we had more time, we could do a therapy thing here now, where you could just share with each other, and you could pour them out to each other, all the ones you've known and loved and hated. And then you could rip them up and set fire to the paper in the bin. That, that's, it's a great thing. Do it later. Do it later. It's great. And if the alarm goes off in my hotel, I will not thank you, right? But this is what's going on back in our schools right now because it feels like more stuff on top of everything else. So we're going to have to do what on top of what as well as what. So people don't see it as transformative. People just see it as more and more and more stuff on top of what we already do. So one of the critical challenges for me is how do we use ACP as a catalyst for proper transformation? How do we sell it as a transformative tool, not as something that fits on top of every other new initiative educators have lived through for 20 or 30 years? How do we drop this right the way through the cake? See, partly, and there's a kind of duality to, to this for me, partly the way we think that way, that there has to be silver bullets, there has to be a quick answer, is kind of because of the way we were educated. Have a look at this image on the screens. Not me, not my bald head. That's awful. It's awful when people do that. Have you noticed? You look at yourself, and I'm, you know, quite conscious about, now I'm at that certain age where I'm getting weightier and balder and less attractive. And I don't want to see myself in 20 foot tall images. <laughs> it's not good. It's a, oh my God. Anyway, have a look at this, this is much nicer. Right, have a look at this picture. This is a fishing village in Ireland. And if you look closely, and I, I know some of you are a long way away, you should have bought the opera glasses. Um, if you, you will see that there is a man stood on a van that is sinking in the water. Now, this is a bit of a predicament. This is a problem. Now, I can't be sure, and I don't want to state this as a fact, you know, in the world of post-truth. I want to lay out from the beginning, this might not be a fact, okay? But there is a bar just out of the photograph. <laughs> now, if the two things are linked, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's a pretty good guess. Now, what you will notice about this scenario is that there is a gathering of people around the problem. And if you're really observant, you will notice that the gathering of people around this sinking van are all men. Now, my wife has a theory about this, which she is happy to share with me, and I'm going to share with you. She recently told me, when I first discovered this image, she said, Richard, you have to understand that men, in my experience, she said, are pretty much useless at most things. <laughs> Another reason why I travel, frankly. Um, <laughs> men are, are useless at, at most things. I'm glad she said most, not all, there's room. Um, she said, because most of the time, she said, I find when I'm talking to you about issues and problems, what you tend to hear is blah, 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 blah. Unless she said, there's a physical problem. She said, I think it must be primal in you. It must be a caveman thing that men have. That they hear blah, 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 but when they hear physical problem, men come alive. 
They say, oh, physical problem. Leave this to me. Now, the men have all come out of the bar because they have sniffed a physical problem, which clearly there's no way their women folk could solve. So they've come out of the bar to solve this physical problem in the belief, because this is the other thing with men, apparently, even the smallest thing, if we do anything in life, we expect there to be a party to celebrate it. So at home, like, my wife juggles everything, right? Household finances, the whole lot. She does the whole thing, right? If a light bulb needs changing, I'll go and change the light bulb. She never says anything about everything she has to, and she's a school principal, right? If there's a light bulb needs changing, I'll go and change the light bulb. Then I'll walk into our lounge and go, I have changed the light bulb. <laughs> Waiting for the celebration to begin. <laughs> right? So these men have gone out to solve this physical problem, and they have all assumed man problem-solving pose. <laughs> now, they're not stupid, right? Men aren't stupid. We're not, honestly. They have decided that the best way to solve this problem is to use the crane, which is there usually to lift the crates of fish from the water. And they've decided to use the crane, hook it up to the van, lift the van out of the water, go back to the bar, and celebrate their manly genius together in the way that only men can celebrate mutual manly genius. Everything is going wonderfully well, look, right? What you notice about this image now is there are now three times as many men. Because nothing attracts men to other men more than success. So now they're all there, celebrating their manly genius. They are about to go back to the bar. They are expecting this story to be handed down for generations to come about the day they saved the van from sinking. This should be told through their fathers and their forefathers and their grandfathers and their godfathers and everybody, everything else. For they shall be paintings on caves of this great moment. The celebrations are about to crack off when this happens. Now, what you need to notice about this picture is that all the men are now running in the opposite direction. <laughs> Those of you close enough will notice there's also a dog in the picture. The dog is a boy dog. Even he is running in the other. Now, here's the problem, right? And this is partly the problem with education. Because we are brought up to believe that if something doesn't work, it's because we didn't try hard enough. This goes all the way back to our own times as kids in school. From day one, we are kind of raised to believe that if something doesn't go the right way, it's because we didn't do it hard enough. So when we're kids, and if you have the confidence in a class to put up your hand because you don't understand what the teacher's talking about, and you say, look, I'm really sorry I've missed that. I don't get what you're saying. When we were kids, our teachers would often turn around to us and say, that's because you weren't listening properly. If we don't get the marks in a test that we were expected to get, what happens most of the time is we're lectured to and we're told we didn't study hard enough, we didn't revise hard enough, we didn't prepare hard enough. Do more, do it harder, do it more intensely. And here we are in education, running education, working in education, and for years, there's been a big problem because the system hasn't been working properly globally. So what happens is we just throw more and more stuff at it. And as teachers, at peop as people at the sharp end, counselors, people working directly with our students, we are made to believe that the reason it's not working is because we're not trying hard enough. We become really guilty about it, don't we? To the point where we end up having daft competitions with one another in our schools of how many hours you gave up at your weekend, as if that shows how passionate you are and how much you care. We've all had those comments. You know the ones over the photocopier machine on a Monday morning, how was your weekend? It was all right. What did you do? Well, not a lot. I took most of Saturday preparing for this week. Marking, what about you? Oh, only Saturday. Oh, I, I got an hour Sunday night. And then you turn around to the head of the math faculty and you say, what about you? And he'd say, oh, I, I worked eight days last week. Oh, my God, that's why maths is a problem in this school. Um, <laughs> kind of live with this belief, right? So we tend to think instinctively 
that if something isn't working or we've got to try something new, what we actually hear is not let's do something new, let's transform this. What we tend to hear is so you, what you want is for us to work even harder. So there will be resistance amongst your colleagues in your schools, partly because people aren't hearing about the possibilities and the brilliant ideas around ACP and what that can add to a student and to a community. But what they'll be hearing is, so you want me to do more. And we have to somehow skillfully change that narrative because otherwise we end up in the same old problem. So here we are, these guys, right? They, they gather back together and they realize that actually the problem for them is that they just didn't have a big enough crane. So they get themselves a bigger crane, right? Now when they get themselves the bigger crane, all the men are back again. <laughs> this time they are gonna party so hard, right? This is gonna make Wisconsin look like amateurs at partying. Right, at this party, there is going to be more beer and more cheese than you've ever seen before. This is going to be the party that kills all parties. This is the moment of magic. They are about to go and celebrate their testosterone fueled manliness. The tragedy of this story is that I don't even need to show you how it ends. So here's the thing, this isn't about doing more, it's not about doing stuff more intensively, it's not about working harder, it's about working differently and this is, this is a big cultural shift in education. This is a big cultural shift in education because when you look at most policy, when you look at the levers that are pulled at policy and political level around education. When you look at most of the new ideas that are presented to us as things we need to implement to change education, they're not actually predicated on change at all. They're predicated on how do we make the existing system work more efficiently. And this for me is the loop we've got stuck in. I don't know how many of you noticed that this morning the OECD published their new PISA International League tables. If you didn't notice it this morning and you work in education, by God, by tomorrow you will. Because you know what will happen. The media will look at the table and they'll go, the US hasn't shifted. We've not got any better. Countries like Singapore are at the very top. And Finland, damn Finland. <laughs> South Korea, China, they're all at the top and we're lousy, we're in the middle somewhere and it'll all be beaten up on us and the policy makers will go to town and they'll say you've got to be more efficient, you've got to do more stuff to prepare kids for these tests because this is the future and then what will happen when the cycle comes back in three years time, nothing will have shifted because it's not about making the system more efficient. The challenge that we all recognize, because we work with these remarkable kids, these teenagers, these incredible students, every day of our lives, is the system itself is no longer fit for purpose. And this is why, for me, ACP is not just another new initiative. It is a catalyst to truly change the perspective of how we educate our kids. You know, I was talking earlier to somebody, and the tragedy, the tragedies for our kids are so different. But take, take a kid from a comfortable middle-class home who's done everything she's ever been told to do. Study hard at school. Did that. Study hard at school, get the right grades, get yourself into the right college. Did that. Get the funding. Done that. Got my head down, worked really hard at college, got the grades. Got the qualifications I needed. Did that. That's brilliant because now, now you can take on the job that your mum and dad had you mapped out for when you were six or seven years of age. 
And then that young woman gets into that job and after a few months goes, oh my God, I hate this. This is not what I want. To. I, had a, um, I had a cousin. And if I'm honest, when we were kids, I was really jealous of him. Because he was one of those kids who was just naturally brilliant at everything. He was brilliant at sports. He was academically just so talented, it was ridiculous. He got offered a place at Oxford University when he was 16 years old. And he wasn't sure, but his parents said, of course you've got to go. You've got to go to Oxford University. If I don't know what I want to study, of course you do. Well, what, what, what do I want to study? You're passionate about engineering, remember? Am I yet? Okay. But why do I want to do engineering? It's not about the engineering, son. The degree's high value. It'll open the world up to you. You can work in the city or something really wonderful. You have a huge salary, big house, lots of holidays, super duper pension. Is that what I want? Yes, of course it is. Okay. So he went off to Oxford. He studied for three years. During his second year, he was approached by the company, in those days it was called Arthur Anderson, now it's Accenture, one of the world's biggest management consultancy companies. He was offered a job halfway through his second year. So he was sponsored through the rest of his college degree, and at the end of the degree, he was promised a six-figure salary. And he said to us, is that what I want? Yes, of course it's what you want. You're earning more than any of your friends. Fabulous. So he went off and he took the job. And he was there for two or three years. Now, as a parallel, this shows you how he was the guy you should have invited here, frankly, to speak, not me. Um, because at the time, I had decided that I was going to be an actor. And I left school at 18, and I believed I didn't need to go to college because I was going to be an actor. I was going to be Laurence Olivier. I mean, frankly, I looked in the mirror at that age, self-deception, too much alcohol. I thought I was going to be the new James Bond, if I'm honest. Um, and I left, I don't know why you're laughing. Um, <laughs> That's why I'm wearing the black, to not get the drift. Anyway, so I was, I was kind of, and I had to do all sorts of jobs because I was frankly a useless actor. I had no talent whatsoever. Um, I'd been all right as a six-year-old playing the Virgin Mary in our Christmas nativity, but that was probably the height of my uh, achievements. So I was driving a delivery van around the outskirts of London, right? And I was looking at my cousin who had a six-figure salary and a jet on standby and all this nonsense, right? And one day he had a day off. And he said, look, we haven't hung out together for a while. We were a very close family. We're only 18 months apart in age. He said, I would, um, I'd love to just spend the day with you. What are you doing? I said, well, I'm driving around London delivering stuff. He said, well, can I come and hang out in the van? So he did. And the morning started, and we put on the radio, and we did the stuff that young guys do, you know, driving around, the music on too loud, looking at girls out the window. Yo, <laughs> I'm going to be James Bond. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> and driving around. And we're having a great time. We stopped off somewhere for lunch. We got a sandwich from a service station, and we're just munching down on our sandwich. And he burst into tears. It's a guy, six-figure salary. First class honours from Oxford, valedictorian. He was just unbelievable. Burst into tears. I said, what on earth's wrong? He said, I knew it anyway, but today's proved it to me, Richard. I am just so unhappy. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm trapped. He said, I did everything I was told I wanted to do. Everything. Oxford job at Accenture, big salary, bought myself a home. I've got a huge mortgage on a house in London. So that's what I'm trapped because I can't, I've got this, I've got a girlfriend who's with me and she loves the lifestyle. So I hate it. I hate all of it. And I looked at him and I thought, my God, how tragic is that? You know, often we look at the kids at the bottom end of the scale socioeconomically. But I looked at this kid, and he was trapped. I mean, it, it took him two or three years further to extricate himself. And the real tragedy is, the only way, and this, is, this was tough for us as a family, 
He went to live in New Zealand because he needed to get away from his parents so that they stopped trying to influence his life. And it was the only way he could find of getting out of the rat race he'd found himself in. We can't let that happen to our kids. Besides which, we can't keep selling the myth, can we? That if you do this and you go to college and you get a good degree, you'll get a great job. And if you get a great job, you'll get a great job for life. Because the myth doesn't exist anymore. So we have to be connecting learning now to kids much closer, much younger, to their pathways. I would argue right the way from elementary school, actually, and tomorrow, if any of you haven't had enough of me and you want to come to my breakout session, I'm going to tell the story of what we did in a little elementary school, which was basically ACP kind of 15 years ago. So if you want to come, come. But my passion is we're waiting too long. We need to connect kids to the real world and how learning can really make a difference to their lives way younger. We need to help expand their opportunities. You know, because then you look at the kids at the other end of the scale, the kids who have nothing, the kids who, frankly, it is a miracle, and, and the counselors in this room will know this. I used to look at kids like this. You know the ones you look at and you think, it's a miracle you're even here today. I do not know how you managed to get yourself up and out the house and here today. How do you do Because I couldn't do it. I couldn't live with the pressures you're living with. Those kids that have nothing. And because they have nothing, they have no experiences on which to pin opportunity or the future. They have no ladders or ideas as to where their lives could take them. You can't expect a child to have aspiration if they don't have experience. So how do we ensure that those students too get an opportunity to see and experience different things in their lives which allow them to make informed choices? Because that's to me where the superintendent was talking is where the link is so powerful. You cannot generate aspiration in a young person unless they have a dream. You can't tell them they should aspire to something if they've never had experience of it or it hasn't made their heart beat a little bit faster or their blood pump. So we have to make sure, don't we, that our students from day one aren't going through this mythology of study hard at school, get the grades you need, and then we'll introduce you to the opportunities you might have in your lives. That we have to change the thinking and that means ACP is not about making the system more efficient. It's about genuinely creating the catalyst to transform it. Because the one thing we all have in common, whether we're in this room or not, whether there are colleagues back in our schools and our communities who are driving us mad because they're expecting us just to roll this out and let them get on with their lives. The one thing we all have in common is we, most of us, 99.9% .9 of us are passionate about the kids we're privileged enough to work with. So let's make sure that we use this to help those young people discover their passion. So I've already referenced, and this is where you're ahead of the curve. I've already referenced the OECD this morning and their PISA tables. My great regret about the OECD is that most policymakers don't ever bother to read the actual research and documentation. They just look at the headlines. Because if they did, they'd actually find some stuff that I think underpins the principles of what you're trying to achieve here very, very powerfully indeed. So in 2013, the OECD produced a report called the Skills Outlook. It was the first global research of its type looking at the links between education, employment, and skills. It's worth looking at the executive summary. Because the executive summary has four headlines. And these are the four headlines on the OECD's international exploration. Now, when they did this research, they didn't just talk to educators. They talked to some of the world's biggest businesses. They talked to social organizations, charitable organizations. They talked to entire communities about what it is our kids need to be successful in the future. And here are four of the key findings. The first one fascinates me. 
The first finding said this, the education systems in the world that are currently obsessed with testing and qualifications are the education systems which, are moving forward, will be the ones where their young people find it increasingly difficult to get work. And the reason for that is very simple and totally understandable. Systems which are predicated around high-stakes testing and qualifications are systems where educators are forced, if you like, to focus on outcomes for those tests, for those qualifications, at the expense of real learning. And everyone in this room knows what I mean. We get close to testing time, everything gets jettisoned, kids spend days, weeks, months, years just prepping to take tests. Not learning anything, just, pre just prepping to play a game. And the OECD's research pinned this very strongly, that too many of the world's most developed education systems had become so obsessed with that process that they'd forgotten about real education. They'd forgotten about preparing kids for the future. The second finding, which I think is really interesting, so according to the research, and they talked to over 2,000 of the world's most successful employers. They said, what are the skill sets most important to you when you're looking to employ future generations for a workforce? Now, 50 years ago, when the same question was asked of big businesses, the answer came back, without any doubt, the most important skill set young people left education with were routine cognitive skills. That ability to absorb information, remember it, repeat it. By far. You think about the industry of 50 years ago, you can see it. It's why the Chinese education system currently is so phenomenally successful. Because they're in the heart of their industrial revolution. They don't want free thinkers. They don't want entrepreneurs right now. What they want are people that are technically brilliantly proficient to be able to carry out kind of tailorist jobs which are predicated around the idea of efficiency and productivity. So the, the pattern works. Why it's no longer working in countries like the US and the UK is because we're living in post-industrial economies, yet we're still putting routine cognitive skills at the absolute heart and the epitome of the education system. It's this idea of rushing over to Asia and believing we've got to copy what they do is ridiculous because their economic arc is in a different place to ours. We're going backwards when we do that. Employers in the research in 2013 said by far the most important skill set we're looking for today from our future employees by far are interpersonal skills. Routine cognitive skills was so down the list of desirability that it didn't even feature on the graph. This blows my mind. Because when we're still debating education on policy level, no one's talking about it. We're still obsessed with this idea of academia and knowledge transference. We've got to get out of that habit. We've got to, we've got to start breaking the mold. And we can only do that if we tie together closer the idea of careers and education. Which leads me on to the next two thoughts. Third finding, back to the companies again. By far the most important skill sets they're looking for in people is the ability to learn, adapt, and change. It's what they want. And then the fourth finding, which I think is most pertinent here this afternoon. If we're to build education systems fit for the 22nd century, and by the way, is that not what we're actually trying to do here? This idea that somehow the 21st century and 21st century skills are some kind of mythical thing in the future does my head in. We're nearly two decades into the 21st century, and kids being born today are going to be living in the 22nd century. So surely what we need to be doing is putting far closer links together between the worlds of work and education. You know, this idea that schools and colleges are where we educate kids 
for the world of work and then we hand them over to the world of work. And then what happens is the people in the world of work are going, but they haven't got the skills we wanted. So we have to create a collegiate approach, don't we, to the future of education. You know, it reminded me when I first read this report of the brilliant old African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. I worry sometimes that some of our most developed economies have forgotten that. That somehow parents think they deliver their kids into the education system at four, five, six years of age. And they expect to collect them at 18 or 21. Educated. It's our job. So again, I think the future for me around schools, and I said this so many times in interviews, schools have to be the community hubs of learning, the brokers of education, not just the deliverers of education. So we need all members of society to be actively involved in the education of our kids. Businesses, charities, social entrepreneurs, parents. And it seems to me that looking at the guidance of ACP, again, it's the catalyst. We get it right. We create that community hub where everybody in a community comes together to properly and skillfully educate our children for their futures. So where do we begin with this? Well, I think we have to take a step back. I think we have to start again. And one of the things I ask you to think about over the next couple of days is what's our vision for our kids? This is one of the ways we get away from this silver bullet mentality. What is the vision? And what I mean by that is this. Does Wisconsin have a clear idea, let's say just at the end of their school lives, what Wisconsin should, students should look like as human beings when they leave school education. Here's a challenge. Wouldn't it be brilliant if wherever those kids worked, anywhere across the nation or the world, people went, they went to school in Wisconsin, didn't they? Because you had a real clarity about the skills and behaviors and profile of what students who have attended school in this state look like as human beings, as functioning adults. Wouldn't that be an incredible thing to be able to do? You know, it's interesting because in the life I've had in the last 10 years, I've been very privileged to meet some interesting people. And what I'm gonna do through the rest of my time with you this afternoon, because I know most of you came here this morning, and I get it, I'm a realist. Most of you came here this afternoon thinking we have no idea who this guy is. Some people think I'm the budget version of Sir Ken Robinson, which is kind of fine. I'm okay with that. You know, in the supermarket, they have the luxury brand, Ken, and they have the economy brand. I am the economy brand of Ken. I get that. It's fine. I'll live on that. That's okay. It's not a problem. Bloody hate the man. No, I don't really. He's my mentor. I love him. But, so what I'm going to do to compensate for not being Ken is I'm going to tell you about the famous people I get to hang out with so that vicariously you think more of me, okay? So by the time I finish on the stage, you'll go, we still have no idea who he is. He's still nowhere near as good as Ken Robinson, but he knows some famous people. So that's what we're going to do. And I've shaken them all by the hand, all the people I'm going to tell you about. Just so you know, I've shaken them by the hand. So if you want to greet me afterwards, just know this hand has not been washed in 10 years. Okay? So let me tell you about my first famous friend. So I got the opportunity a couple of years ago to have lunch with Eric Schmidt. Now, I don't know how many of you recognize the name. Eric Schmidt is the executive chairman of Google. Don't ask me how it happened. I'm just a former teacher with a very big mouth. Right? He was in London. I don't know how it happened, but we arranged to meet for lunch one day. Right? So I turn up at this restaurant. And because I'm English, I have the ego the size of the US. Right? And I remember it was one of many occasions where my wife looked at me in complete, you know, I, the night before I said, God, oh, Lynn, she said, what, are you nervous about tomorrow? I said, no, I'm not nervous about tomorrow, but I want to make sure Eric is comfortable in my company. She said, Richard, he's the executive chairman of bloody Google. You're a teacher. He is not going to be overawed. 
I said, you never know, love. Anything's possible. He may have had a really bad time as a kid in school. Who knows? You find that, though, don't you? You know, people find out you work in education. Sometimes they suddenly treat you like a priest. Have you noticed this? They go back to their childhood. I remember being at a party a few years ago, and somebody swore, and they turned to me and went, oh, I'm really sorry. Like, what? So anyway, I'm prepared for meeting Eric the next morning to make him feel comfortable with himself. So we sat down for lunch, and I prepared my banter. And we sit down, and I've ordered steak, and he's ordered lettuce because he lives in California. <laughs> I'm having wine, he's having water. Body's a temple. Um, <laughs> so we sat down, you know, I get comfortable, and I think, oh, okay, let's, let's start this off on gentle footing. I said, so Eric, how long have you been here? He said, oh, about three or four days. I said, great, have you done anything good, been anywhere excited? He said, well, actually, last night, and I, he was, he was uh, in London with a co-author. They'd just written this book together. He said, I can't remember his name. He said, um, yeah, we went for a brilliant French meal last night. I thought this was my moment. This was my moment to create a connection. So, French meal. I thought, now I'll pretend to be knowledgeable about the French restaurants in London. So I said, oh, French. Yeah, it was great. I said, which one? He said, oh, no, not in London. He said, we took the jet to Paris. Now, at this point, you're sat there thinking, do you do what's in your head, which is, you what? Or do you act, play it cool, Rich, like you hang out with people like this all the time? So I played it cool. I went, oh, did you? Yeah. In my head, I'm thinking, we are so far apart. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I then asked him a question, which has interested me for, for many years, long time, silver bullets, all that stuff. I thought, if anyone had a count of you, it would be Eric. I said, Eric, do you ever see a time where technology will replace the teacher? Because if there was going to be somebody that would have a mind-blowing view, it might be Eric. But what happened next kind of amazed me, because his answer was immediate and unequivocal. He didn't even blink before he gave me his answer. He just immediately went, no, never. I went, wow. I wasn't expecting that from you. He said, Richard, look, technology is incredible. It's an incredible facilitator. It's a catalyst. It's a tool. It's remarkable. It, will ch it has changed the world. He said, but look, education has always been and always will be about the development of human beings. He said, in order to develop human beings, you will always need high levels of human interaction. I thought, wow. That's Eric Schmidt, the executive chairman of Google. He said, when we appoint people at Google, we're not looking for technical stuff. We're looking for the people they are. We're looking for the relationships they can form with other people. We're looking for their abilities to collaborate, to be emotionally intelligent, intelligent to take risks, to be creative, all that stuff. So that doesn't come from sitting in front of a machine taking in knowledge or watching video lectures. That comes from the nurturing spirit of the human relationship. Eric Schmidt, executive chairman of Google. So ACP isn't about technical stuff, is it? It's about a way to broker the human relationship. It's about the way to develop people. So anyway, then Eric was relaxed in my company. He even had half a glass of white wine. He was really chilled now. And I said to him, because this was the moment of sheer arrogance, I cannot believe to this day I said it to him. I said, so tell me, Eric, tell me about the challenges you're facing at Google, as if this elementary school teacher from the middle of the UK could help him with this problem. I said, tell me about the challenges you face at Google. And to be fair to him, he didn't bat an eyelid. He went, I will. He said, when I joined Google a few years ago, he said, you know, I was asked to, to join the company initially to help um, Sergey and Larry monetize the concept. So I was brought in to, to create the business. He said, I'll tell you what, when I arrived, he said, Google was the most amazing, magical, exciting place I had ever worked. It's unbelievable. So everywhere you went, people were just sharing ideas based on a very clear vision. He said it was the vision that Larry and Sergey had started 
when they'd first come up with the algorithms and idea for Google. He said those two guys were passionate about the democratization of information. He said that every being was about seeing the internet and the potential for the internet as a way to democratize information. They passionately believed that the control of information, if you like, in the old world, had led to power and dictatorship. Their absolute belief was if we can democratize the world's information, if we can organize the world's information and make it available for everybody, we can diminish evil. And that's the Google vision to organize the world's information, make it available for everybody, and by so doing, diminish evil. He said, so I used to walk around, Richard, the campus, and listen to people having ideas. So I will never forget one day walking past a little group of people, and one of the staff was telling her colleagues about the idea she'd had for mapping the world in 3D and photographs so that anyone could visit anywhere on the planet from their computer. This is the place it was. He said, our greatest challenge, our greatest challenge has come from our success. He said, because the more successful we've become, the more the meetings have changed. He said, people aren't having ideas based on our vision anymore. He said, now when you walk around the campuses, People have become obsessed with what other people are doing. So you hear people saying things like, have you seen what Apple are launching? Have you seen what Twitter are working on? He said, when I track our short history, he said, our greatest disasters have always come when we've tried to react to what somebody else was doing. He said, so my greatest challenge now in the position I hold at Google is to keep our people confident and focused on their ability, their skills, to deliver on our vision. Not to be diverted by what, what are they doing better? Oh, look at what they're doing, we better do what they're doing. Oh, 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 look what they're doing. And when he was talking, I was thinking to myself, that's exactly the challenge for us in education, isn't it? It doesn't mean we shouldn't share and see what other people are doing, but we become so easily diverted Oh, there's the, we've got to do, oh, you see what, look, look what South Korea are doing. We've got to run South Korean mathematics in our schools. No, we don't. No, we don't. To be as good at South Korea as mathematics, our children would have to have, all of our children would have to have four hours of private tuition after school. It's not going to happen. To be as educationally academic as Shanghai we would have to limit our families legally to only being allowed to have one child per household. That sharpens your worldview. Not entirely sure I can see the policymakers in America going, oh yeah, let's do that. Or the kicker for me in a place like Shanghai, which was until today top of the food chain, just so you know it's not anymore, because now it's had to be part of China. The last pizza it could be on its own, now it has to be part of China. Right? One of the things they do in Shanghai under the law, is you are allowed to fine any parent up to a month of their salary if their child misbehaves or underperforms in school. <laughs> Try running that past the legislature. <laughs> that would go down like a lead balloon, wouldn't it? <laughs> so this stuff is ridiculous. We've got to have our own vision. So I go back to what I said to you a minute ago. Over the next couple of days, share with each other, debate with each other, have a clarity. What kind of human beings do we want Wisconsin children to be when they leave the school system in our state? And let's try and engineer and design a system that ensures that to the best of our ability, we're focused on our vision for our kids in our community. That means we have to think about three things. I was talking in my new book, I got the opportunity to interview Sir Richard Branson, second famous friend, right hand, I shook his hand too, as you know. One of the top British uh, entrepreneurs. Interestingly enough, we have, um, you know we have The Apprentice in the UK too, the TV programme. 
Yeah, no, I'm looking at who is the celebrity on The Apprentice thinking, no, no, don't even think about it. Um, Sir Richard Branson was invited to be the Donald Trump figure on The Apprentice when it first started in the UK, and he turned down the job because he said, I don't like the idea of firing people. He said, because I believe as a leader, and I think this is a wonderful statement. He said, I believe as, as if a leader, you have to fire somebody, you failed them. You gave the wrong person the job in the first place, or you didn't support them in the right way. Firing somebody is a declaration of your own failure. Oh, what an amazing thing to say. And I actually think there's an interesting standard there for anyone involved in education, don't you? Because I think there's something similar. So anyway, I was talking to him about how you build a vision into practice. He's done it to unbelievable success. He said three words, Richard, is what we work on. He said the first is clarity. Do you genuinely have a coherent idea for what you stand for in the eyes of your customers? Now, in terms of what we do every day, the thing that everyone in this room that binds us together is, we know in our hearts that our primary customers are our kids, not the parents, not the legislature, not the administration, our kids. So do we have a clarity, that clarity, that vision? What do we want them to be as human beings? The second stage, coherence. Does every behavior of every member of staff in our school, in our district, in our organization, in our state match that vision? Is it coherent? And this is one heck of a challenge that I'm sure you will support each other over the next couple of days. And I said just before I came up on stage, the interesting thing is the people in this room are pretty much the converted. You're passionate about the idea, the program of implementing it. But there has to be coherence from everyone else in your school, in your college, in your district. Because if not, this will just be another sugar-coated idea. This is the only way this stuff works. Are we focused on our customers and our children? Are we coherent about the way we implement what it is we need to implement? And that brings me on to the greatest challenge that all of you in this room face. And by the way, I don't think this matters about where you are in a traditional hierarchy in a system, whether you are an administrator, whether you're a senior leader, whether you're a counselor, whether you're a teacher. It does not matter. By choosing to work with kids, everyone in this room is a leader. can't be about hierarchy. Everyone in this room is a leader. Because everyone in this room, our job is to empower other people. And that's the art of leadership. It's not doing it for them. It's not managing people. It's about empowering other people. So everyone in this room is a leader. But the critical challenge and responsibility for them, for us as leaders, is do we symbolize the best values of what it is we're trying to achieve here? In every conversation, in the language we use, in the meetings, in the relationships we build, do we symbolize the best values of what it is we're trying to achieve? So just a couple of challenges for you moving forwards. I want to move on now to my next famous friend. Now, the one thing also I want you to appreciate here in my schema, in my head, is that I'm trying to increase, I'm trying to ratchet up the fame level as we go along. <laughs> so if I have time to get to the end, we're going to go for the real big dogs, okay? Uh, in the hope that I leave you with a bang. This might be it, I don't know, I'm running out, we'll see how we go, okay? But, again a couple of years ago, I got the opportunity to meet one of my personal heroes. I don't know how, how many times you've had this happen to you, but this was the first and only time it had happened in my life to this point. I got the opportunity to meet a man who's changed the world. Now, the opportunity arose because I was invited to speak at a big convention in Saudi Arabia. And if I'm honest, I wasn't sure about whether I wanted to go or not. Particularly when I tell you, and it wasn't an education event, the theme of the convention was empowerment. So morally, you can imagine, you're juggling with this a little bit, but I am cheap, you'll get to know this about me, I don't have much moral fibre. And when they told me who the other keynote speaker was, 
and they promised me that I could have five minutes alone time with this guy, I caved in and I said, oh, what the hell, I'm coming, it'll be fine. This other guy was one of my heroes. So, right, a bit like with Eric, I'm one of these people that has a tendency to over-prepare for when I'm meeting famous people. I tend to overthink things. I don't know how many of you share this thing. So, like, about two weeks before I was going to meet this guy, right, I really got obsessed about the minutiae, even down to how should I say hello to him. One of my heroes, a man who's changed the world. So I practiced on my son. Now, I know, I mean, some of you are thinking I'm mad, right? But this, I'm serious about this, okay? How do you say hello to a kind of man that's changed the world? Do you do the, you know, really could you go, poo wee, how are you? Do you do that? I don't know. I'm English. Do I bow? Do I curtsy? Do I kiss their hand? What do I do, right? So I practiced on my son. He just said, get a life. Then I knew I was going to have five minutes in his company. So I thought, I have got five minutes with a man I believe has changed the world. I'm going to have time to ask him one question. I need to make it a good one. I need to practice it. Because I knew what would happen. I'd get there, I'd be nervous, I didn't want to be tongue-tied. I wanted to be fluent, I wanted to be cool, I wanted to get the question out. All my friends knew I was meeting this guy, they were all waiting on his answer. So I got my question. So then we're ready, and I go to Saudi Arabia, and I go on stage, and I'm the warm-up act. You know when you go to a big rock concert? No one cares about the warm-up act. Most people are still in the bar drinking. Right? When I got on stage, and so I had one spotlight. When this guy got on the stage a couple of hours later, he had lasers, smoke machines. The room was 4,000 people strong. Right? But I didn't care, because I was going to meet him. So I did my speech, and I came off stage, and I'm being led to the room, the speaker's room, where my hero is. And as I'm getting closer to the room and I can see the door, I'm overthinking it again, right? And I'm thinking, oh my God, behind that door is my hero. And then I'm thinking, be cool, be calm, be cool, be calm. You know how to do the hello. You've practiced the hello. You've got it sorted. You've done it a million times. Get the hello out. The question will flow. It'll be fine. Be cool. Still your heart. And we got to the door. And the door opened. And as the door opened, all that came out of my mouth was, and I can't believe I'm sharing this with you, all that came out of my mouth was, oh my God, it's you! <laughs> now, he was a bit taken aback, but I think he was kind of used to this, right? And you know those out-of-body experiences where you're watching yourself being an idiot? You know, like you've got a camera up, like a selfie stick, and you're seeing yourself. And you're thinking, get a bloody grip, man. <laughs> Pull yourself, do not blow this. There are people back home wanting to hear about this meeting. So as I'm striding towards him, and he's just stood there, right? As I'm striding towards him, I'm now practicing the question, thinking, get the question right. As I get up to him and I put out my hand, the man stood face to face to me is Steve Wozniak co-founder of Apple. And I think I've got it, right? I think I'm calm. I think I'm cool. I think I'm ready to go. And as he shakes my hand and does that, you know, very was thing, hi, I went blank. I'm with a man who I believe has changed the world, a personal hero. And I can't believe this happened. Because all that came out of my mouth, five minutes, one question, that's all I've got, with a man who's going to rock my world. I practiced it for two weeks. All that came out of my mouth was, can I have a selfie? <laughs> now, what made it worse is as we both looked up into my phone and he was very generous in agreeing, I realized that I was holding a bloody Samsung. <laughs> I thought I'd blown it. I thought, how do I explain this? to anyone back home. I mean, they all think I'm a moron, but now they think I'm a total lunatic, right? How am I going to ever get through this? So the thing is, redemption came. I couldn't believe it. We did the event, we separated. I never got the chance. I get on the plane to fly back from Riyadh to London, do my seatbelt up, and I look next to me. And who sat next to me? was. He sat next to me. 
I was so excited. You should have seen his face, but I was really excited. He was thinking seven and a half hours, oh my God. You know how you always, when you're traveling alone in an airplane, end up sat next to that person? You see them in the airport and you think, what are the chances, the thousands, when you end up sat next to them on the plane? Like, Hello. So what are you flying for? Are you going home or on business? So that's me. And Voz is sat next to me. And we did get talking. He gave me lots of time. And I just want to tell you about some of the things he said. Because I think this is our ultimate challenge. And once I've done this, I'm, g- I'm going to leave you with it. And then, um, and then I'll hopefully see some of you tomorrow. So, we're sat on the plane, and it turns out Woz knows quite a lot about education. What I hadn't realized about him was, he said, you know, when I was a child, about eight or nine years of age, he said, I was one of those kids who a lot of people would describe as dysfunctional. A lot of us in this room will know kids like this. He said, I was one of those kids that just didn't know how to play with other kids. He said, I was that child who desperately wanted to be friends with other people, but I guess tried too hard and didn't have the social skills. He said, so I was the kid that on the yard would end up in a fight, not because I was aggressive, but because I was clumsy and I just didn't know how to make friends. He said, so about eight or nine years of age, I'd move myself to the back of the classroom You know, to an extent, the classroom had become survival for me. I wanted to be invisible. He said, I remember at that age, looking out the window at the back of the room. He said, to this day, I can't believe what happened to us. It was never a plan. He said, but I remember sitting at the back of that room, looking out of the window, thinking, when I grow up, I'd love to be able to make the world better for people like me. He said, "And, and at that time in my life, given the experiences I'd had, he said there were two potential options. He said one was to be an engineer. He said my dad was an engineer, and engineers changed the world. He said the second was to be a teacher. He said because in that year, in that grade at school, he said I had a teacher and she used to make me feel like I could fly. So I don't know what it was about her, but when I was in her company, I could speak, I was funny, I was confident. She made me feel like I had all the skills that I needed to have. So those are the options. He says, you know, you know, history will tell you, I kind of chose engineering, Apple happened, he said, but I left Apple in 1987. He said, and when I left, he said, it was actually quite scary. He said, I was still a very young guy. He said, we'd accomplished, he said, I was very lucky because even at that point in my life, I had more money than I would ever need. He said, naturally, as a young person, that's quite scary, particularly when you've been driven. He said, and I remember having a conversation with my wife. And she said, do you remember your promise as a child? He said, yeah, I do, actually. He said, so I held true to it. He said, so what people don't know about me is for the next seven years... I went and taught technology in a local state school. So the guy has some interesting understanding and experience around education. I said, what have you learned? He said, well, there's one thing above all things, he said. He said, it strikes me and it troubles me. He said, when the world debates and discusses uh, uh, the future of education, people seem to become obsessed with what it is we should teach our students. He said, from my worldview, what we teach our kids isn't really that relevant anymore. He said, but what really, really matters is making sure that they know how to learn. I said, wow. So where does that come from? He said, well, really, it comes from our time at Apple. He said, you know, when we were working at Apple, he said, when we started Apple, we were were both working at Atari, we were doing Apple in in Steve's uh, stepdad's garage. By the way, I was just as a side point, the other day I was in South Korea and I met um, Nolan um, Bushnell, you know, the founder of Atari, whose claim to fame is he gave Steve Jobs his first job. 
That's an interesting one, isn't it? He said, by the way, Jobs, he said, was an absolute bloody nightmare. But he was a genius. And talk about regret, right? Never live with regret like this man did. Because I looked at it, I looked and I thought, wow, amazing. You're one of the, you know, great global mega stars of the whole thing. I said, what, it, I mean, you know, I said, what must it be like to be you? We were having breakfast. He said, well, I'll tell you what, I've had big regrets. He said, the biggest one was Jobs. He said, not long after Jobs and Wozniak had started tinkering in Steve Jobs' stepdad's garage, and I knew what they were doing. They were taking parts from Atari to start to build their stuff, right? He said, Jobs came to see me in my office one day, and he said, Nolan, um, look, you know that Steve and I have started this thing, and it's got really serious, and we're looking for an investor. And Nolan said, well, what are you after? And Jobs said, well, we need about $50,000. And Nolan Bushnell said, for what? And he said, well, we'll give you, I don't know, 30, 33% of the business. And Nolan Bushnell said, I don't really see a future in personal computing, so I'm going to take a pass on this one. <laughs> so over breakfast, you know, you can't help but ask the man. It's like rubbing salt in the wound. I said, um, Nolan, I said, just as a matter of interest, do you happen to know how much those shares would be worth now? <laughs> He said, happen to know? He said, I look every bloody day. <laughs> he said, yesterday, my shares in Apple would have been worth $138 billion. So anyway, <laughs> Woz is there in the garage, and they're tinkering, and they don't get money from Nolan, right? But things were happening really fast. They did get investment, which meant they were going to have to hire people. So one night, the two Steves went out for a beer to talk about their hiring policy. And he and was said to me, there's a load of rubbish written about Steve Jobs. There's a lot of myth, legend and myth that never really happened. He said, but that night we were, we were drinking in a bar, and he said it was the first time that he did turn around to me. He said, you know what, was, If we're to make this work, then we can't be a company that makes stuff. Because if we make stuff in this valley, we'll be dead in three years. So we have to be a company that keeps innovating and, and we have to keep giving the world stuff it doesn't know it needs yet. And the reason they were having this conversation was they'd gone out for the beer to talk about the kind of people they, they needed to hire. And what Jobs was saying was, you know, hiring clever people, particularly in this valley, is easy. The most technologically advanced university in the world at the time was the heart of the valley. The valley was like the gold rush. The brightest, smartest, most academically gifted kids in the world were heading to the valley wanting work. He said, so you know, we could walk into a bar, a cafe, click our fingers, and brilliant people would be everywhere. He said, but if we're to make Apple work, we need something different. And that night, they came up with a mantra, a promise. And Woz said, you know, it must work, Richard, because Apple still use it today as a core philosophy when they're hiring new staff. And like all things that Apple create, on the surface, it's unbelievably elegant and simple. But when you scratch underneath the surface, the complexity is extraordinary. And I'd like to share that motto and promise with you today by way of a challenge. And I'd like to suggest to you that as you explore the potential of ACP, as you explore the potential of working together, of implementation, of catalyzing and transforming the system, at the heart of it all, this seems to me to be the most eloquent thing we have to achieve. That night, the promise they came up with was this. At Apple, we will never employ anyone who needs managing. Over the next couple of days, through the breakouts, through your time together, I'd really like you to unpick that because of its complexity. And I'd like you to reframe the question and say, how do we use ACP to create young people in Wisconsin that don't need managing? Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you.